Hi, my name is Tim Conklin, and I'm proud to be gay because of the new relationship that I have with my parents and my friends and my family. Welcome to Gay Fairfax, a monthly video magazine sharing news, views, and pride. I'm Michelle Michaels. And I'm Barry Forbes. Each month we'll feature personalities and events of interest to the gay women and men of Fairfax County. On this edition of Gay Fairfax, Jim Pattison will talk candidly with us about living his life with AIDS. We'll also meet Dave Pallone as it reflects on the discrimination he faced as a gay umpire in professional baseball. And in our first segment, we'll be entertained by the light-hearted yet insightful singer-songwriters Ron Romanofsky and Paul Phillips. Romanofsky and Phillips, as they're known, have been billed as the gay Sonny and Cher. Dave Hughes met with the duo after the recent performance at the Gay and Lesbian Parents Conference. Some liberals say that it's okay for people to be queer as long as they don't flaunt it. But it seems to me, my dears, that we've seen straight folks flaunt their sexuality for years. Sounds suspiciously like homophobia to moi. When Harvey Milk made City Hall, Dan White shot him dead. The Twinkies made him do it, that's what his attorney said. He could have gotten life, but he got seven years instead. And it sounds suspiciously like homophobia to me. Oh, it happens all the time. It's not considered crime. It's just another sign. Homophobia, homophobia. It happens to the dykes and faggots on their bikes, the young and old alike. Homophobia, homophobia. Now the fact that AIDS is not a gay disease has been ignored. And the facts about transmission are repeatedly obscured. Tell me, how can so many people be so misinformed? Sounds a lot like blatant homophobia to me. Happens left and right. That's why we must unite. We gotta stand and fight. That old homophobia. We sing along with us. Ho 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 homophobia. Ho 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 homophobia. Ho 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 homophobia. Homophobia. Let's pick it up. Ho 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 homophobia. Ho 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 homophobia. Ho 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 homophobia. Homophobia. One last time. Ho 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 homophobia. Ho 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 homophobia. Ho 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 homophobia. Now, tonight and for the performances of yours that I've seen before, you're generally playing for hundreds of people and they're very appreciative and they usually stand and applaud and all this sort of thing. But surely back in that first year or year and a half, it wasn't like that. What was it like in the beginning? What was it like getting started? We were dreadful. We were dreadful. There's no way around it. We were dreadful. We were so nervous. We were so scared. We, we, we didn't, we hadn't figured out what we were trying to do and you know I, I mean we would do things like I mean just the way in which we presented ourselves was so homogenized and 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 sort of um, all the all the individual life taken out of it and sort of like tried to fit you know into something and we were just really we used to wear these well. these really uh, <laughs> silly <laughs> <laughs> matching black and white outfits that were um, people used to say well, we look like middle-aged lesbian couples because, <laughs> because we would like I would wear white white shirt and black pants and he would wear white pants and black shirt and stuff you know mix and match sort of like I don't know it was just we were dreadful I can't think of any other words but not in the first year maybe <clears throat> but th then we started we wrote a few good songs and yeah. uh, we started to just relax a little more on stage and started to use comedy more and um, I don't know somehow 
found in spite of ourselves, it developed into an act. I, you know, we believed so much in what we were doing and what we had to say, I and mean, we just thought we were, we had, you know, we had something really new to, to share with people, and, uh, and somehow it, we had enough momentum. Yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, was, early on, I didn't even believe, really. No. I mean, I led him to believe that no. I believed in it, but. Well, I, I wanted. I, I really wanted very but, much to be, be a songwriter and a singer and make my living touring and. Um, I think I wanted to use up every ounce of, of youthful naivete that I had, be, you know, before I got too old and, and, and cynical to, you know, to stop believing. I mean, if, if we had known that what we were doing was impossible, we never would have done it. Mm -hmm. that, <laughs> what, at what point did you kind of wake up and realize, yes, it is happening, people will listen to this, let's chuck the day, the day jobs and go for it? He, he's, he, he came to me and he said, Paul, I, I'm going to book us a tour. And you're gonna have to like leave your job or get a you know leave of absence or something. And I said, okay, fine. You book a tour. I'll quit my job. No problem. <laughs> Believe me, Ron. I'll, I'll do it. As, I never know. thought he was gonna quit that job. Well, I never believed he was gonna book the tour. <laughs> you know, I thought, yeah, I, you know, to my friends at work, I was saying, yeah, you know, my lover's gonna like book this tour, and he's like really, th he really thinks he's gonna do this. And I was like cracking up on the inside, you know, just thinking, oh, geez, it's you know, and it's like I didn't want to burst his bubble. He was so sweet and innocent at the time, and you know. Huh. It just, you know, it was like, I just thought, well, the, the thing that a lover's supposed to be is supportive, and so I would support him, and the whole time I was thinking, this kid is in another world, this kid is dreaming, he has no idea what reality's like, and then he went and booked this tour, a 20-city tour, we were unknown in the, uh, in the country, and he booked the tour, we and I kind of was like, well, yeah. I have to quit my job now, goodbye, and it was that that really, you know, made the transition it wasn't it wasn't like a real belief it was more like he had the belief and i had made the promise so <laughs> and you were tired of your job yeah that's true we had we had released this terrible cassette of ourselves it was a live recording very poor quality and Which we went out on the, the road audience has them at home they should please burn them oh no okay thank you we we went out on the road and did this tour all over the country and uh oh we had all these terrible problems this van we had this van that broke down in iowa and you know we we had all these accidents and bad weather but the audiences were so great and they loved what we were doing and that just kept us going from one city to the next and we were always just barely making it with money but we were making it to the next town and we sold like about 800 copies of this tape and when we came back from that tour I think we realized we could probably you know borrow some money make a record and we could keep doing yeah. this for a while and that really got the momentum going and we've been we've been doing I'm, it we've been making a living at it since then for the last six years so, on, that, on that tour um, was when we first realized that people would really actually loan us money to make an album because people kept offering saying, you know, when you're ready to make a real album, we'll be there with the money. And so we ended up borrowing money for this first album from people who had no real idea of who we were. They had no idea how financially responsible we would be or anything. But it was all trust and love and support and and I think a common belief in the fact that we had something, that there was something there. And even if we weren't quite sure what it was yet, there was something there and people wanted to encourage that, you know. Do you have any plans for the future? Uh, that we do plan, to, we hope, we plan to make another record in the next year or so. We don't have, we can't really nail down a date at this point, but we have been working on a lot of, and performing a lot of new material and we do intend to commit it to CD pretty soon. <laughs> Very good. In fact, Romanovsky and Phillips have three records out already. There's I Thought You'd Be Taller, which was their first effort that was financed by all the uh, volunteer donors that sprang up. <laughs> there was uh, Trouble in Paradise, which came out a couple years after that. And their third one, Emotional Roller Coaster. Hey, I'd like to thank you once again for taking time out of your schedule to spend a few moments talking and letting the people of Northern Virginia get to know you a little bit better. And uh, next time you come through the area, I'm sure you will get some more people in the audience because they first heard about you here tonight. So I hope so. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Hey, well, thank you once again, and uh, best of luck to you, and I hope you keep at this for many years to come. Thank you. People living with AIDS are often portrayed as reclusive invalids. However, Jim Pattison breaks that stereotype. A resident of Northern Virginia, Jim leads an active and fulfilling life. 
as a volunteer coordinator for an area pharmacy's AZT distribution program. Jim, thanks for being with us today. Well, thank you. Tell us, how long have you known you've had AIDS and how did you find out? Well, I had a stroke at work approximately two and a half years ago. And as a result of the stroke, the testing showed that it was uh, due to the AIDS virus. And uh, it's rather an unusual condition, really. Most people don't usually have strokes. And even more so, they don't usually recover from them as well as I have. But here I am. That's amazing. How, how did you react when you made this discovery? <laughs> well, in all honesty, I didn't react uh, in surprise to the AIDS itself. Uh, it was not a total surprise that I would get AIDS. The thing that surprised me the most was the way that it manifested itself in the stroke. It affected my left side, it affected my handwriting, it affected my voice. And I was almost paralyzed. Uh, I could barely walk. And my biggest surprise, and this is what I told the doctor at the time, was the loss of the voice because you couldn't take my voice away from me, you know. But uh, as you can see, I recovered. And it happened in about, I would say, three to four months. I used to say six weeks, but I've now realized it's longer than that. But over a period of time and an adjustment to the medication, apparently the two coincided, and I did recover. Everything to my handwriting. So... Uh, I would say I'm 95 to 98 uh, percent recovered from the stroke itself, not from the AIDS, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. That's still there, but you learn to adjust to it and, you know, go on living mm -hmm. as best you can. How did your partner adjust or react? Well, my lover is negative. Uh, we will have been together for 10 years, and very shortly, as a matter of fact, and uh, his feeling on it was that he expected it too and still does wouldn't be surprised to this day if he got it but again would not blame it on me uh we don't know where i got it much less where he would get it if he got it don't misunderstand me we're a monogamous couple but we also know that the time span which uh the virus can incubate can cover it's been proven at least 9.8 years, so you say it could be even longer. We don't know. But he's tested negative as recently as a month ago. Hmm. Well, Jim, you've now been living with AIDS for about two and a half years. How has your life changed in those two and a half years, and how do you face life from now on? Well, Barry, to begin with, I took uh, disability. I went on mm -hmm. disability at work, and I took uh, Social Security because the doctor said, and still says to this day, that if I went back to work and got into a stressful situation of the type that got me to where I, you know, had the stroke, that I might have another one. Hmm. So it wasn't really a matter of election. Uh, it's not something I chose to do, but since I had the time on my hands, I do volunteer work. Uh, basically, I work with the clinic in uh, D.C., I'm sorry, well, which clinic is that? Whitman Walker Clinic. Mm -hmm. I'm a registered volunteer with the clinic. Uh, I have managed for a year the first age residents in Northern Virginia hmm. for the clinic. Uh, although it's in conjunction with Northern Virginia AIDS Ministries, uh, they also have a co-manager of the house. And for a year I worked with them. And I withdrew from that uh, earlier this summer because I didn't feel that, or I did feel that the stress I was getting from it was drawing me down, and I wanted to rest for a while. I'm not, I have not withdrawn from the Schwartz housing program of the clinic, but I'm on an inactive uh, status, you know, uh, until things smooth out a little bit. So you're living the same way except for living with AIDS, or can you sometimes forget that you do have AIDS? I don't think it's something that I ever forget. You know, you asked me this earlier, and I thought about it quite a bit. And it's one of those situations that uh, I honestly don't know that I ever forget. Because can, no matter how good you feel, mm -hmm. there will be something that constantly comes up and reminds you that you have it. Uh, 
sometimes it's a pillbox beeper that goes off at the wrong time. The pillbox beeper is a uh, digital timer pillbox, mm -hmm. and in it are several doses of medication. So regardless of how good you feel or what you're doing, every four hours you're reminded mm. by this. And then there are certain things uh, that you don't do. I w certain foods will upset you. You know, that would, in conjunction with the medication. Not necessarily because of the AIDS itself, but because mm -hmm. of the medication. Uh, I think that generally I can do almost anything at this point that I've always done, with two exceptions. One is that I can't do them as long. And secondly, that I can't do exertion things that I ordinarily would do. I don't go jogging. Although exercise is good for AIDS patients, don't misunderstand mm -hmm. me. Jim, what advice would you give viewers who know people living with AIDS? Well, I think first of all that I would advise them to treat them normally. There is no way that an AIDS patient can convey the disease to another person without sexual contact, or intimate sexual contact. Secondly, if a viewer has AIDS, I think the biggest thing that I would want to impart to them is to please do everything you can to maintain a positive attitude, but at the same time to take the medication that the doctor prescribes. Mm -hmm. I recently had a guy call me and go off the medication himself only because he felt that it was prolonging the inevitable. Well, I don't agree with that. I'm a perfect example of the fact that it's not just prolonging the inevitable. I'm here to over two and a half years later and it could very well be that I'm going to be here for another two years and there may very well be at least a chronic control, something on the form of the way they control diabetes with insulin uh, within that length of time. So yes, I'll take what I can to stay here as long as I can. But positive attitude. Uh, instead of looking at it as a half-empty glass, look at it as a half-full glass and do what they can to help themselves and other people should try to help them because all too frequently they desert people who have AIDS. Hmm. Well, Jim, I want to thank you very much for joining us today on Gay Fairfax, and I think that we can all learn a great deal from you living and living with AIDS. Well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed meeting you. Thanks, Jim. When Dave Pallone was fired from baseball, the National League claimed he was guilty of what they called unprofessional behavior. Pallone insists that his only crime was being gay. His new book, Behind the Mask, My Double Life in Baseball, candidly discusses his 18 years of being a closet gay man in America's favorite sport. Gay Fairfax reporter Rob Wilson interviewed Dave Pallone at a recent book signing event at the Lambda Rising Bookstore in Washington, D.C. Let's talk about that um, double life as a gay umpire. Uh, How did you cope with the intense homophobic atmosphere in, in your workplace there? Oh. Well, it was, uh, it was very difficult, Rob, to uh, understand uh, uh, wh why people were so homophobic. Uh, in our, in our uh, society, you, the first thing that we get when we're born in America is that we're free. And I didn't have that sense of feeling when I was within baseball simply because I knew in my heart I was gay, and if I came out of the closet at that particular time, it would have been very difficult for me because of the fact not only I was known as a scab in, in, the, in, in the ranks of umpiring, but to be gay on top of that would have really crucified me. So to have to live with the fact that I was gay and I wasn't a free person like I am now, today, how I feel so great, and, and you've seen me, how, how sociable I am with people. That's the way I've always wanted to be, and I couldn't be that way because I couldn't be the real me. When the National League did release you, they claimed that it was for unprofessional behavior. Or, or were you released because you were gay? There's no question in my mind that I was released because I was gay. Uh, the unprofessional behavior you speak of is, is the media linked me with, a, with a, uh, a teenage sex ring in Saratoga Springs, New York. I was summoned by the district attorney in New York City to ask, uh, excuse me, in Upper State, New York, to answer some questions. I went with my attorney, as I've always been told, and, <clears throat> excuse me, I answered the questions to the best of my ability and to the satisfaction of, uh, uh, of the district attorney. But Major League Baseball wasn't satisfied. 
uh, they felt that they had more evidence of unprofessional behavior. And my, and my question to them was, how can you possibly have evidence and how come the district attorney's office doesn't? And why would you offer me money to, uh, <clears throat> to leave baseball if I did something wrong? If you had evidence of me doing something wrong, why would you pay me a dime? This is what the problem is with Major League Baseball. They have this double standard, the double standard of having convicted felons in their midst and let them continue to play baseball and also to let them own a club. They recently had a player who was con arrested and convicted of having sex with a, a female minor. Is that the type of person that they want to have as a role model for our young children of today? Or do they just want to have someone who is, who is a professional, who is uh, known around the country as a very good person and just happens to be gay? I don't understand that's double standard. And I think it's time that baseball decides uh, somebody has to come to baseball and take off their mask, the mask of discrimination that they carry around with them. Um, how has the National League responded to the book, or have they? Well, they have not responded to the book. They have told uh, many people to uh, be quiet about the book. That's always been their case. Any time there's ever been a controversy in baseball, when it comes to such as this, they keep quiet about it. They feel that the publicity will go away. And if, if they have publicity, if they make a comment, it will give more wood to the fire. But the unfortunate part for them this time is that they're dealing with one particular person who is, has a very loud voice. He did because he was an umpire. And now he's going to make that voice heard even louder as he goes across this country. And it's not going to stop when the book sales dwindle down because it's going to continue. And not from August 1st to September 1st of 1990, but it will continue on throughout the many more years I have on this earth. And baseball, until such time, they take off their mask of discrimination, they will be hearing from Dave Pallone. Why did you write Behind the Mask? I had, a, I had about a few reasons to write this book. The first one was, I have, ever since I've been in the game, my, any, any stories about me have been distorted. My side of the story has never been told correctly. And this gave me the opportunity to tell my side of the story and get people to read it and then to judge me the way they wanted to, uh, fairly. And that's all I've ever asked. Second of all, I felt that it was, there was a need there for, as I said, therapy for myself. It was really hard to go through some of the tough times again, but it was good to remember all the funny things that happened. But I think the utmost important reason is, is that I lived a double life. It's so hard to live one life on this earth, never mind two. And I felt that if I could write this story and just help one other gay man or lesbian to understand this book and understand how important it is, A, to respect yourself and respect to who you are, and B, come out of the closet and never to live a lie again. It's so important. And if I could get that message across to them, that it's so important, not just for our community, but for themselves, then I know that I wrote a good book and that the book was important to write. Go back to your late teens and early 20s. If you had picked up a book like this at that time, what would Dave Pallone be today? I think that I would have been a better person. I would have been truer to myself because then I would have had a role model. You know, I think uh, that's something that I want to be now. I want to be a role model for our, for our gay community. Uh, there are so many of us out there that didn't have a role model when we were growing up because we thought we were all alone. And until such time as we found out there were many more of us, we didn't know what to do. We thought we were sick. We thought we were uh, weird. I don't know. I know I felt that way. So if there was a book like this for me to read when I was growing up younger, I mean, even when I was 19 years old, I would have been so much happier and so much better off. Life after baseball. Retired 37? 38. 38. You're, uh, you're launching a book. What's next? I want to be more active in the gay community. I've made that promise. I lived in the closet for so long, and I never gave anything to the gay community, so that's number one. And number two, as a career, I'd like to go on a lecture tour, which I've already signed up to do. Um, and I think I would like to pursue some broadcasting. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where it will take me, 
but uh, I've made it known throughout uh, this little tour that I'm doing, and it's not little, it's been a big one, <laughs> uh, to let them know that uh, I want to be a broadcaster. So I've made that challenge to Major League Baseball. They say they're not homophobic. Okay, you're not homophobic, hire me. Let's find out what they're made of, right? Let's see what they're made of. All right. Thank you very much, Thank Dave. Thank you. Really right. appreciate your time. All right, no Great. problem. Gay Fairfax is always looking for new team members. If you'd like to cover the gay community and learn television production skills, get involved today. Write to us at Gay Fairfax in care of FLGCA, Post Office Box 2322, Springfield, Virginia 22152, or call us at area code 703-451-9528. On the next edition of Gay Fairfax, we'll talk to Alexandria Mayor Jim Moran about his bid to unseat Congressman Stan Paris. And we'll take a look back at the rise of the Washington Blade from a neighborhood newsletter to the successful gay newspaper it's become today. For Gay Fairfax, I'm Barry Forbes. And I'm Michelle Michaels. Remember to keep the pride alive. Some liberals say that it's okay for people to be queer As long as they don't flaunt it But it seems to me, my dears That we've seen straight folks flaunt their sexuality for years Sounds suspiciously like homophobia to moi When Harvey Milk made City Hall, Dan White shot him dead the Twinkies made him do it, that's what his attorney said. He could have gotten life, but he got seven years instead. And it sounds suspiciously like homophobia to me. Oh, it happens all the time. It's not considered crime. It's just another sign. Homophobia, homophobia. It happens to the dykes and faggots on their bikes, the young and old alike. Homophobia, homophobia. Now the fact that AIDS is not a gay disease has been ignored. And the facts about transmission are repeatedly obscured. Tell me, how can so many people be so misinformed? Sounds a lot like blatant homophobia to me.